River Chase Dermatology. My name is Shannon Branty and I'm a physician assistant in Naples, Florida. I am joined today by one of our new physicians to the practice, Dr. Michael Wartels, who comes to us um, from the Ocala area where he practiced for 22 years and originally did his training in New York. Welcome, Dr. Wartels. Well, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I've been with River Chase for about a month now and it's just a wonderful place. I love the attitude and the excellent care that everybody gives. It's been phenomenal. Well, we couldn't be happier to have you. We're so um, very thrilled that you're part of our team. We're going to be speaking today about the importance of a full body skin exam. Many of our patients um, may actually uh, look at this dermatology download to learn a little bit about what to expect during their very first annual exam. Um, so would you start off by please discussing the importance of an annual exam and at what age should someone get started? Yeah, that's a great way to start. Uh, first of all, it's extremely important because the earlier you catch something, the easier it is to treat. So as some of you may know, there are certain types of skin cancers, especially squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma that can be life-threatening. Most of the time, if you catch them early, they're easy to treat. Uh, additionally, there are precancers that oftentimes on an annual exam can be found. You can stop things from spreading to the melanoma stage. So it makes things a lot simpler for you. Less cutting, less big surgeries, much better chance of not getting a life-threatening condition. As far as what age, I think that would depend upon the uh, person. Uh, we do see melanomas in adolescence. is actually the second most common cause of uh, cancer in adolescence. I usually recommend at around puberty, a full skin exam for everybody. And then at that point, depending upon risk factors for the family and other things, might determine it. If there's not a lot of pigmented lesions, there's not a family history of melanoma, I may wait until they get to their 20s or something to start doing it. Um, additionally, sometimes we have children who are born with moles or at a young age develop mole, known as congenital nevi. Sometimes they have a higher risk of turning into melanoma even at or before puberty. Usually if someone has that, they will see a pediatrician, hopefully a dermatologist, they might need be, to be guided differently. So usually I would recommend one time at the beginning of uh, puberty for most people. And then at that point, it can be gauged depending upon the, the risk. And they also can be educated on what kind of things to look forward for, look for as far as changes to worry about. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And, and I agree that there are a lot of younger um, people who are more aware of the dangers of melanoma and skin cancer, certainly in Florida. Um, so I agree that, you know, the younger, the better and, and catching them maybe at puberty. But then if they don't have a lot of atypical looking lesions, um, maybe later on, uh, starting back up in their late teens or early 20s. Agreed. So do you believe that once a year is typically adequate or do patients need to come in multiple times a year? It depends on how they're doing, what the situation is. For most people, once a year is adequate. However, if someone's had recent skin cancers, especially squamous cells or melanomas, in the last year or two, they should be seen more frequently. If there's a strong family history of melanoma and they have lots of dark moles that are being followed, perhaps more than once a year as well. Uh, additionally, there's certain people that are immunosuppressed, maybe they're getting chemotherapy, maybe they're getting immunosuppressive therapy for a, uh, a medical condition or maybe for organ transplant, something like that. They have a much higher risk of skin cancer. Um, certain people with very, very light complexions, red hair, blonde hair, multiple freckles, they have many sunburns and multiple skin cancers over the years. Some days we might see them more often than once a year, but for most people, once a year is, is adequate. As long as they know what kind of things to look for that might you know, bring them in sooner than once a year. And are there any warning signs that should prompt someone to come in earlier? I think you kind of discussed that a little bit, but uh, what specifically should make someone come in earlier than their exam? Okay, basically, um, if anything's changing, so we have a growth somewhere in your body and it's changing, it's getting larger, it's starting to hurt, it's starting to bleed, it's starting to scan, it looks different. It's rubbing on things like it never did before. That would be one thing. Um, additionally, it's important to know about melanoma. And melanoma, we talk about the A, B, C, D, and E's of melanoma. So I'd like to talk about that for just a second. Melanomas uh, usually start as very, very dark moles, normally black. Um, the difference between that and a regular benign mole is the following. Um, first, A stands for a asymmetry. A melanoma will frequently be asymmetric. It doesn't look one side, doesn't look like the other side. B has to do with the border. A benign mole often has a clear demarcation between where the mole starts and where the uh, skin starts. Whereas with the melanoma, the border can be scalloped, it can be a little bit fuzzy. Sometimes it just almost looks like a coastline. You can just see a little bit jagged. It's kind of hard to distinguish exactly where it starts and stops. C, color. 
Benign moles normally are uniform in color. There are exceptions, but most of the time they're uniform in color. Melanomas often have different shades, gray or black, and sometimes you can have different colors. Sometimes you can even see red, white, or blue in melanomas. Different colors in the same mole is, is a worrying sign. D stands for diameter. And years ago when this started, they put it at six millimeters because most melanomas are larger than six millimeters. Although as the field has evolved, we're, able, we're starting to find them earlier and smaller than six millimeters. I found quite a few that are less than six millimeters. Um, there's certain ways dermatologists can sometimes do that. So in general though, if you're not sure about a mole, if it's larger than the size of a pencil eraser, which is six millimeters, that can be a worrying sign. Again, there are exceptions to that. If a child has a uh, mole they're born with, they're often a lot larger. But in that scenario, they would be followed by a pediatrician probably or a dermatologist. Or, uh, additionally, there are other types of growths that are not melanomas that people call moles, things like seborrheic keratoses. And those kind of things can be much larger than uh, six millimeters. So for that, that gets us to E or something that's evolving or evolution. If you have a growth that's changing, like I mentioned before, so you have a growth that's getting bigger, it's starting to itch, it looks different, any of those kind of things. Even something you've been told is a benign seborrheic keratosis, those can be missed. A lot of people over the years, I've seen things in the past that I thought were seborrheic keratoses, but they were changing. And lo and behold, they were melanoma. And I've had things that were short of melanoma. I did a biopsy and lo and behold, it was a pigmented seborrheic keratosis. It happens to everybody. So if something's evolving or changing, then I would come in sooner. Perfect. So say this is my very first full skin check. Never been to a dermatologist before. I have no idea what to expect, or I'm bringing my young teenager in for the very first time. What should they expect? Well, it's a very good question. It's a pretty simple situation. Normally what will happen is the medical assistant will ruin the patient and will ask them to strip down to the level of nudity that they feel comfortable with. So some people get totally undressed. Some people leave their undergarments on. We usually like people to take their socks and shoes off. They'll be given a gown. Um, and then once they've changed, the, uh, they'll come back in with the physician or physician provider will come in. And then literally we'll look at, every part of your skin that we can see. So in some people, you know, they don't want us to check the genitalia. We may not do that, but in most people, we'll pretty much check everywhere we can see. Sometimes the scalp's a little harder to see. We try to see through it. People have a full head of hair. I sometimes mention to people, it's not a bad idea. You know, a lot of times here in Florida, the places where you get your hair cut, they're checking your scalp. They're, they're very aware of that. And That's I've had true. people come in for that. And sometimes once we educate a patient, we tell them how to look or have someone in the family look when the hair is wet, we don't normally, you know, if someone's got a strong family history of melanoma and they have a lot of hair, we might actually wet down the hair a little bit. But in general, we'll have the whole body surface examined. And then at the same time, answer questions you may have. You know, most people have several questions about their skin. They've got some lump or bump or rash or something they've always wanted to ask about. So we'll discuss that. Uh, additionally, we'll go over things like sunscreen recommendations and things on how to prevent skin cancer. Additionally, if we find anything that's like a precancer or that looks like it could be a cancer, we'll then discuss it with you and, and likely start treatment. Speaking of that spot of concern, what's the process if a patient, or if you, excuse me, during the exam, find a spot of concern um, that you would like to evaluate it more closely? What's the next step? Well, basically it depends. Um, sometimes we th see things look like precancers. So there's something called actinic keratosis, which is very common, especially here in Florida. It's common to people, usually over 35 or 40, who've had a lot of sun damage. It's often a scaly area, it might be tender. If I see something like that, I may treat it. And the treatment could be as simple as spraying with something very cold called liquid nitrogen, or perhaps prescribing a cream that might treat it. Or there's something a little more extensive called photodynamic therapy, where we might bring them back to treat it, but not normally as a first thing. Additionally, someone may have a mole that looks atypical, that might look like it's pre-melanoma, something we call dysplastic nevi, or they may have growth that look like skin cancer, could be like a basal squamous cell melanoma. If that's the case, we'll take a, a biopsy, and that involves a little injection, it might sting for two or three seconds, and then we just take either a piece or the entire lesion off, send it to the lab, usually get results in five days to two weeks, and the patient has to keep the area clean and a band-aid on it. Um, and that would be pretty much what would be done. And then we would call the patients back once we have the results, regardless of the results. Perfect. So if a spot of concern um, is found actually to be precancerous, or if it's found to be cancerous upon biopsy, what's the treatment? What's the next step? Okay, well, it depends. If it's precancerous, like an actinic keratosis, some of them have to be scraped out of the very, very thick and, and, and not amenable to other therapies. But as I mentioned before, a lot of times we can just spray with liquid nitrogen or give a, a type of cream that the patient can use at home or treat it with this photodynamic therapy. Uh, if something is uh, dysplastic nevus, or other types of uh, certain types of skin cancer, 
there's different ways. It depends. So for dysplastic nevus, sometimes we just take a, a larger scoop of the area. Sometimes it's very aggressive. We might cut around it with stitches. If it's a basal cell, squamous cell, or melanoma. And there's other skin cancers besides those three, but those are most common. It depends on how aggressive the cancer is, whether it's a new lesion or a recurrent lesion type of the body. It, treatment can be as simple as just scraping and burning it out, called ED and C. It can involve, that takes five minutes. It can involve cutting out with stitches under local anesthesia. That might take 20 minutes. Um, if it's not amenable to therapy, we might send you for radiation. That's a bunch of treatments. That's often anywhere from two to five treatments a week for maybe six weeks, but it's very effective. Or there's something called MOHS, M-O-H surgery, uh, M-O-H-S, pardon me, surgery, which is actually the most effective and usually a treatment of choice for aggressive cancer. So if you have something in an area, it's aggressive cancer, it might be a squamous cell or it might be a certain types of melanoma, it could be a basal cell, it's recurrent, it could be in an area where it's hard to treat, you want to, uh, you want to spare as much skin as you can, it, let's see, it could be on your lips, your nose, your eyelids, something like that, Mohs is recommended. And what happens with Mohs, normally if you have something cut out by a lips, the, uh, the provider knows, based upon the type of cancer, how much of a margin to take. So they might take, say, half a centimeter, for instance. With most surgery, they actually examine the skin right at the time, the sample, they do a frozen section. So they just cut a little tiny border around the cancer, then you wait 30 to 45 minutes with the dressing on there, and then the doctor examines the entire margin. And let's say at three o'clock, there's some more cancer cells, they take a little border there, and they keep doing this you know, stage after stage. You could have one stage and be clear, it could be four or five. I've even seen six stages. Um, it could be an hour. It could be all day. But once it's clear, then you have a defect or a hole. And then depending upon how large it is, they may allow it to heal by secondary tension um, on its own. They might put some stitches in. It may be just a simple few stitches. It may be complex. It might be a transposition or it might be a skin graft or a flap. Um, and then they send you on your way. The advantage of the most surgery is it's a higher cure rate, probably 99% plus if it's done by a good most surgeon because they know that the cells are clear at the time they do it. Also, there's a potential for less of a scar because they're cutting out less tissue. So the hole's smaller, so the defect's smaller, so it gives you a lot more options on the repair. And it's very, very good in areas where you have very little skin to work with, ears, nose, lips. Mm -hmm. Some people might say, well, why don't do moles on everything? And there are patients that want to do that, and there's a reason we don't. One, it takes a lot longer. You can, you can have somebody, first of all, it's, it takes a lot longer. And if you have someone who's elderly or really doesn't need it, they don't want to be there for two, four, six hours if they can have a five-minute scraping or a 20-minute excision. Two, it's not recommended for all skin cancer. Some are easy to treat. Their primary might be on the back or a simple lesion. And insurance companies actually will not allow you to treat, do most or to every single skin cancer. It's a lot more expensive also to the insurance company and for patients if there's a copayment. So in an ideal world, yes, most probably is the highest cure rate but it's not um, generally acceptable to do for every skin cancer. Okay, so let's debunk some myths about UV and tanning beds. Are tanning beds actually safe? In a word, no. Uh, unfortunately, many years ago in the early 70s, they were invented, I believe, in Europe. They came to the United States in a big way in the late 70s. I know me and my friends used to do it all the time. We even had little portable face units we would use. Thinking that was the case, wanting to get that stock theatrical tan, like all the, you know, movie stars had. And back in those days, you see, ultraviolet radiation from the sun is mostly ultraviolet B, which causes the burning, and ultraviolet A. Back in those days, we thought that B caused skin cancer, and the A didn't. Turns out that's not true. The B was actually a fail-safe, because you couldn't spend all day in the sun, because the B would cause a burn, and you have to get out of the sun. With Huge amounts of ultraviolet A, it's actually more damaging to your skin regarding skin cancer than ultraviolet B is. It's much more deeper penetrating. So it increases your risk of skin cancer greatly. It's been estimated that one treatment with a skin tanning bed under age 35 increases your risk of lifetime melanoma of at least 20% and probably 50% for basal cell and squamous cell. That's one treatment. Also, because it's very deeply penetrating, it photoages you. So you get a lot more fine lines and discolorations and pigment problems and all the things people go to dermatology offices to treat. So it's not good that way. It's not safe. Um, additionally, I've heard people argue, well, you know, I need to get my vitamin D level. So I need to do it. It's just, and that's not true. Vitamin D is an interaction between ultraviolet B and your skin. Ultraviolet A light from a suntan bed is about 95% ultraviolet A and at most 5% ultraviolet B. 
there's, you don't get enough ultraviolet B to get any significant vitamin D production. So that's not true either. So if you really want to have that look, I suggest you do a spray on tan if that's what you want to do. So should our patients in Florida get a few minutes of unprotected sunlight to get that precious vitamin D? We hear a lot about vitamin D right now um, as is, and its importance for our immune system. So what is your recommendation when patients ask you about unprotected sunlight to get vitamin D? Great question. Um, first of all, I agree. I think vitamin D is very, very helpful. And people who live in parts of the country that don't get any sun at all often are very suppressed. There's a lot of people now that think that many of the people that got very sick with COVID who got into the hospital and died were deficient in vitamin D. So the argument about getting the vitamin D levels up to normal, that's a good argument. However, I totally disagree for two reasons. One, 80% of the sun damage you've done in your life is probably by the time you're 20. Partially because many of us grew up in times when uh, we didn't even know the sun was bad. Partially because people under 20 think they're, you know, not ever going to get old and never worry about it. You know, they don't think about that. When I was 15, I wasn't worried about what was going to happen to me when I was middle-aged. Just how it is. No matter how responsible you are, no matter how much your parents tell you, you can have parents who are physicians, it doesn't matter. So because of that, any little bit of sun, it actually is cumulative. So if you had 80% of the damage by the time you're 20, even if you're ultra careful, you still may get things many years later. But every small amount you get over it tremendously accelerates how many more skin cancers you may get or precancers, let alone cosmetic problems. So I don't think there's a safe amount. And as far as the vitamin D, it's simple to take. You can just take a supplement. It's very inexpensive. It's very safe. And your interns could check blood levels of vitamin D and make sure you're at a therapeutic level. So that's what all people should be doing. I think everyone with COVID should know what their vitamin D level is. And should take enough of the, it comes as vitamin D3 in micro units. I think everyone should be taking enough of that to get to the level Unfortunately, there's many people out there, these health experts, oh yeah, just get a few minutes of sun every day, it helps your vitamin D3, it's, it's good for you. And it does feel good. But no, as a dermatologist, I don't recommend even small amounts. So what are your tips that you can recommend for keeping one's skin healthy and having that healthy glow? Well, a lot of things. First of all, I do recommend uh, annual skin checks. And I recommend at that time discussing with the provider your issues, and they can go over a whole bunch of things, including cosmetic things that can help you. Uh, two, I recommend not going to sun tanning beds. <laughs> Three, I recommend as most as best possible staying out of the sun between 10 and 4 when it's strongest. When you're outside, seek shade as much as possible. Wear protective clothing and garments. You know, wear a wide-brimmed hat that covers your ears and most of your face. Sunglasses, which will also help uh, decrease your risk of glaucoma and cataract. A broad spectrum sunscreen. Um, most of them today do block against B and A. Didn't used to when I was growing up. So 30 or higher, that's water resistant. I'd put it on at least 15 minutes before you go outside because it takes about 15 minutes to start working. I'd reapply it every two hours or so or after extensive uh, exercise or sweating. Also consider wearing long sleeve shirts and long pants. There are companies that make products like that that breathe well, that you can wear in hot climbs, you can even swim in that your uh, dermatology provider can recommend to you. Um, I recommend also being very careful and cognizant again of any lesions that are changing and coming in. But, um, oh, one more thing. A lot of people think that um, certain places aren't as dangerous or as bad, like in the winter, for instance, there's certain substances like um, snow, sand, and water greatly magnify and intensify the sun's rays. If you're out on a boat, if you're skiing, if you're on the beach, you have to be extra careful. Even if you're under an umbrella, it's being reflected off of the, uh, the sand. So you're not really as safe as you think in those places. You have to be very cognizant of that. I think For those, sure. Yeah. I often also recommend, I'm sure you've noticed we have quite a few golfers down here in Southwest Florida, and they now make some incredible products just like the UV sleeves that they sell, sell at the pro shop. So even just, you know, having that in their golf bag and being able to throw that on quickly if they don't like the feel of sunblock, um, if they don't like smearing something on their skin and then having a, you know, a, a kind of a greasy handle. Um, there's so many reasons that patients will try to say, oh, I don't like sunblock. I don't like the feel of it. Uh, but you're right. There are so many ways of avoiding um, excessive UV the exposure. So um, one last question, how do you respond to patients who tell you that they don't need that sunscreen because they don't like the feel of it? They don't like the fact that it's greasy um, or if they work indoors and they never go outside um, or if it's, you know, if it's in the winter or if it's cloudy outside and they, they say they don't need sunblock because they're never out. How do you respond to that? Well, basically that brings up two questions. One, people that don't like sunscreen because of the feel of it. 
Um, there's many companies out there, in particular Neutrogena makes a whole host of very good products. Usually you can find one that you like. I find that usually comes from men who don't like putting creams on because they're not used to it or they're lazy with the creams. Most women are better. Um, I often for them, unless they have really dry, scaly skin, I usually recommend one of the sprays. You know, we sell an excellent product at River Chase, actually a couple, and she has an excellent spray. You can spray it even on hairy skin on the arms and legs very quickly. You can spray it on your hands, rub it on your face. So it's easy to use. Additionally, one of the problems, uh, complaints I get are a lot of times people complain that the sunscreen gets in their eyes and it burns. So what I recommend is most people know they sell sunscreen for lips, like, like a chapstick. I recommend for those people that you take make, make a little ridge up here and under the eye, like a baseball player, it's an invisible ridge, and it prevents the sunscreen from getting to the eyes from the, from the you know, capillary. So it actually works very, very well. So I try to take away their reasons not to do it, but then I stress with them how even in the wintertime, in the glassy from the car, at the window, sun's coming through. Here in Florida in particular, the sun's very strong in the wintertime. Cloudy day, there's plenty of sun. I know a lot of people have probably been on vacation, it's cloudy and they've burnt themselves or seen someone else burn themselves. So I try having discussion. That's often a hard one because a lot of those patients feel very strongly. It's, it's very hard. They really don't want to use sunscreen. So then try to go over different types of clothing and things like that too as well if they're not going to put the sunscreen on. So if patients are concerned about a suspicious spot or if they want to come in for their very first full body skin exam, where can they find you, Dr. Wartels, and how can that be arranged? Well, wonderful. I'm accepting new patients. I'm new to the Fort Myers area, and I'm actually doing uh, free skin cancer screenings on the 24th of this month in our forum office and the 25th in the Fort Myers South office. So you can call either of those offices. You can either make a regular appointment at which time we could do an exam and everything needs to be treated, be treated, or you can come in for a full skin exam, totally um, free. And it's a good way to get established and see if there's anything you need to be worried about or concerned about. Fantastic. I think patients will definitely want to visit our website and find out more about those free skin cancer screenings. Thank you so much. Well, thank you.